is responding to current um, stealing of technology information from the U.S.? What is the U.S. doing to prevent our technology and our information from going elsewhere? Like, what are some of those strategies? What are those methods? Right. So, good thing I'm at the Commerce Department, which is like a very central focus of, of some of our, our work right now. Um, so, one of the things um, that we're doing is um, modernizing our, um, our, our investment um, regimes um, and um, thinking about both in terms of inbound investment and outbound investment. Um, to make it more difficult uh, for China to either undermine or to work around uh, our, our regulations and, and restrictions. Because, um, you know, even as we put in new sort of lines of control and we tell businesses, okay, like XYZ technologies, you know, can't, can't be sold, or um, we find, you know, China, you know, certain big um, mergers and acquisitions might have to go through the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., but, you know, a lot of venture capital, you know, efforts didn't. Okay, so that's one modernization effort, right, to make sure that we're capturing the full range of Chinese investment that's coming in. You know, then you find out that, oh, well, actually, um, it's, you know, Chinese investment through, you know, U.S. vehicles, right? New financial, U.S. is developing new financial vehicles. Well, now we have to address that, like SPACs, for example. Now we have to think about how can China use those to get access to U.S. technology. Um, you know, I think a, a big challenge that we face right now, in fact, is deciding the line between um, what constitutes economic security and national security. Um, and, you know, what is it we're going to try to prevent China from accessing, right? Um, is it simply technology that uh, can be used as part of China's um, sort of civil military fusion uh, program? And, uh, you know, that's another element of, of something that we work on very hard is, you know, trying to determine that, you know, when a civilian actor in China wants to purchase technology, how do we ensure that that technology then doesn't actually get transferred to a military actor? That's a very hard and painstaking process. Um, so we are putting more people on that process. Um, and, um, and resisting, I would say, pressures to do it more quickly um, but really trying to ensure that we get it right. Um, so there are a number of, and then, I mean, we have the, our Patent and Trademark Office that has ongoing work with China on intellectual property rights protection. I mean, and that's just trying to bolster people in China that want to do the right thing, agencies in China that want to do the right thing. The court system has become gradually stronger when it comes to this. Um, but there's, a, I would say, a whole raft of, um, of efforts underway um, you know, in the first instance, to figure out what is it that we're trying to protect, what is core to U.S. you know national economic security, and then what are not only the the sort of ways in which China tries to access these technologies today, right? But what's coming around the the bend that we need to prepare for, and how do we develop and harden our defenses? And so, it's not enough to have one reform effort of an institution like CFIUS. Uh, which I think the Trump administration and Congress did a really good job, we have to keep doing it, right? And for the first time, we're thinking about these outbound investment restrictions in pretty significant ways. So these are some of the ways that we're, we're going about this, but it's a very challenging uh, effort. Yeah. Yeah, hi there. I'm Daniel. So you mentioned Oops. some... Oh, I, I don't choose. Okay, fine. I'll let you guys choose. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so you mentioned some very interesting point on domestic challenges that China is facing. Do you know, are there any studies into domestic social movements within China that in some way challenge the existing regime, the way, for example, there have been multiple on social movement and anti-government uh, movements within Russia? Yeah, so if you go back to 2010, 2011, and before that, through the 2000s, um, you could find a lot of, of writings um, by Chinese, by American scholars talking about um, 
things like the potential for the environmental movement in China to transform into something that would push for broader political change. Um, you had salons in China that were made up of billionaires and intellectuals and activists that would meet on a weekly basis, you know, have dinner um, and talk about political change in China. Uh, you had a billionaire who took a bunch of other billionaires to Taiwan on a trip to show them what Chinese democracy could look like. So there was a lot of, of, of work swirling around, um, uh, a lot of, uh, of um, and writing on and the internet also, because the internet pre-Xi Jinping was actually a very vibrant political space um, on which you could find calls for political reform. Um, you know, you had uh, Chinese citizens um, hunting down corrupt officials themselves, right, and operating across provinces. You had environmental protests that would uh, cross provinces. So it did look at that point in time as though there was a potential for um, various um, sources of political agitation, of, of political protest to mobilize, you know, across issues and across geographic boundaries, and frankly, you know, across socioeconomic levels as well. You, you had environmental protests where, you know, young people, young educated people in, in, you know, Beijing or Shanghai would find out about villagers protesting in southern China and would go to offer their support. So it was a, a pretty, I mean, dare I say, exciting time in, in China. Now, no. So the answer to your question is no but I couldn't resist sharing what, what used to be because it was actually a really dynamic um, period. And also I think important um, because there is a, a tendency, I think in Washington, but also more broadly for us to forget, you know, that China is not a monolithic actor and that even if we're not seeing the same kind of protest, the same kind of dissent, mobilizing, being, you know, vocalized, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And we have had feminists, for example. So feminists, the LGBTQ community, those are two communities that have been active during the Xi period, but, but are now, they're now repressing them. And Xi Jinping is very active in repressing the LGBTQ community, in fact, himself. I guess I'm not Hello. In <laughs> so um, the uh, US and uh, China both uh, obviously have a lot of uh, internal problems. So which uh, country um, is better suited to um, sort of uh, address these issues and uh, either uh, in uh, China's case become the uh, global superpower or the US um, staying the uh, global superpower? Okay, really? So I, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, okay, I, as an American and, and someone who's working in the US government and I think, you know, clearly that I would say the fundamental values uh, that the US holds um, even though we may not do a good job of acting on them all the time. Um, you know, basic freedoms, you know, uh, individual rights. Um, it, these are, are better values that, for, to underpin the international order than the ones that China brings to the table. So, um, and I think, you know, it, and I'm guilty of this as well, it's not just the United States versus China here, right? I mean, uh, many countries share the same values as the United States and are standing up to try to bolster the current rules-based order um, as China attempts to challenge it. Having said that, other countries are also now banding together with China in ways to challenge that rules-based order. And so, for example, when China brings things to the UN on human rights. Sometimes it will use members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, various Central Asian countries, to, to make the first ping. It always works with Russia uh, in, in the United Nations. Um, so I, we, are, um, we are deeply flawed, but I think fundamentally uh, speak to the, um, the ideals and values um, that a much greater majority of the people in the world would, would share. But I would welcome other views on that. <laughs> Hello, back here. Oh. Uh, I previously was a co-owner of a in private English language uh, institution oh. in China. 
And over the last several years, specifically this last year, uh, China's uh, employed laws that prohibit private English language learning in China. So we ended up uh, shutting our schools down. And even um, when we continued our school a little bit past the deadline, they put our uh, international teacher in jail. Hmm. And then also, we also try to go around the loophole of sending our teachers out to the individual school uh, homes to teach in that way. But then they set up kind of programs where it's kind of a tattletale program. Hey, you find someone teaching in your house or near your house, uh, we'll incentivize you by giving you some type of cash. Uh, I just kind of want to get your thoughts on that. Um, I thought it was kind of going backwards, but uh, I think in a, my assumption is they want to control what's being taught and educated in the country. Um, but kind of see what your thoughts no, are. No, 100%. Um, I think that's a really, that's a, a perfect example of of the way in which China has um, transformed under Xi Jinping and, and the domestic stage and, and that sort of you know, constraining the range of ideas and um, ability to access ideas uh, for the Chinese people. It's not just controls over the internet, right? But it's shutting down all, all of the, um, not just the English language teaching, but, but all of the sort of private tutoring, online uh, tutoring uh, efforts. You know, nominally, they, again, took these actions for regulatory reasons. They said, you know, we want to make it fair because only some people can afford this kind of tutoring, um, et cetera. But uh, they could have gone a different way, <laughs> which is then to provide, you know, access to this kind of, of tutoring and education and support for it instead of closing it down. And, and to me, that just signals, again, whether we're talking about any form of media uh, in, in China and the educational system, uh, the internet um, companies, um, you know, Xi Jinping is all about um, controlling ideas, controlling the range of ideas um, that can be expressed and, and the ideas to which the Chinese people can have, have access. And I think, you know, the, the other part of that, of course, is that there's pretty significant outcry from a lot of middle class Chinese about the um, effort to try to diminish the uh, opportunities and the attraction of studying English um, because a lot of Chinese still want their children to uh, go study in the United States or the UK or Australia or, or elsewhere ultimately and not having access to that is um, will make it challenging for them. But yeah, hunting people down like that, having people tell on each other is you know big part of the way that the Chinese system has evolved. Actually, not just under Xi Jinping, but for for decades, it's been that way. Um, as a non-American, I think uh, there's a lot of talk abroad about the U.S. kind of stepping back from its legitimate role in international organizations, like rejecting the ICC by putting sanctions on people for investigating war crimes or stepping back from Paris climate agreements and things like that. Do you think in this competition with China, the US has made adequate space to re-legitimize itself in those international institutions, especially considering China has been working on that and trying to embed itself further in the institutional qualities of those institutions? Yeah, good, good question. So um, look, I, I mean, I'm working in an administration that is 110% committed <laughs> To, to not only getting back into international institutions and, and agreements and creating new ones, um, but also to trying to lead them. Uh, and so, and uh, so, is it going to take time for the United States to, as you say, re-legitimize itself? Uh, absolutely. Um, you can't undo damage that's been done, and we've never been perfect anyway. I mean, Trump administration was an extreme when it comes to this kind of thing, but. Um, you know, we're not a member of uh, the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, right, or the ICC, as you point out, and that, you know, predated uh, President Trump. Um, uh, but there is a lot of concern in the international community that, in fact, um, even though they like what they see now with the Biden administration, is this going to last, right? Or will the next US president decide, you know, that the U.S. should not bear, you know, a greater part of the burden of, of you know, leading these organizations. Um, and I guess I would point out, too, that I don't, I don't actually believe that China is necessarily the best participant in many of these organizations. You know, again, if we look back to that period when the U.S. was withdrawing, China did not actually step up and say, yes, let's forge a new climate agreement on, you know, methane. That wasn't China. That was the United States that did that when it came back. 
um, you know, it was exporting, you know, 150, 200 coal-fired power plants through its Belt and Road Initiative. So um, there's a big gap between what China says in many instances uh, when it comes to these, you know, institutions uh, and agreements and what it actually does. Hi, I'm Julia Campbell, a student at Iowa State University. Would you share any thoughts on the Chinese investment in U.S. real estate markets and where you think this will go moving forward? I mean, I, you know, to be honest, um, there was certainly a huge flurry of, of Chinese um, invest in, investment. You know, I lived in New York City um, uh, for most of my career, and you know, I remember when the Chinese bought the Waldorf Astoria, and, and it was a little bit reminiscent, I think, of, of when the Japanese bought Rockefeller Center. It's like, you know, this iconic, you know, sort of landmark in, in New York and what's happening and what are they gonna do and, and you know, um, a lot of Chinese um, billionaires certainly have been <laughs> investing in the US real estate um, market um, as a means of, you know, getting their, um, getting their capital out, right, and safe. Um, you know, I think um, China has tried to limit um, the government has tried to limit this kind of thing. Um, and again, certainly it started with the high-flying companies, many of which were making investments that they had no business um, making. They became over-leveraged, and then the companies basically collapsed. Um, you know, the private individuals, I think, who still want to do that, um, it's more difficult now. I mean, the wealthiest among them certainly can find ways, but um, China has pretty strict capital controls. Um, uh, on individuals, so uh, you know, I haven't I haven't looked. I don't know what the trend line is. I would guess that it's declining, declined since you know a peak from several years ago. Um, but I think there's probably still interest again among the wealthiest in China to um, to get their money out and put it into U.S. real estate. Um. I had, I had a question about, um, you, did, you talked about how uh, China was trying to embed itself in various institutions to pressure individuals and states to sort of toe the line um, on certain topics. And I, I was going to ask you, do you think that there's a risk if there's not enough uh, moral courage that, that like little concessions by various organizations, individuals, and states, or and particularly institutions, could sort of result in an environment where the international community ends up like uh, almost creating like a self-censorship environment. Like, like, do you think that that's something that's a potential risk if there's if there's too much of this kind of concession? Abs absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think you know, um, it's it's partly in institutions and arrangements, and it's it's partly again just China trying to you know whether it's with you know the hotel industry or whatever or or um, you know the movie industry um, saying you know. If you, you know, show Taiwan as a separate entity that you know you're not going to be able to have access to the Chinese market. You may have seen, most recently, that um, Sony had in the most recent Spider-Man movie, <laughs> um, the the end, you know, has the the big denouement is, is takes place at the Statue of Liberty, and China uh, said told Sony that if you don't like diminish the size, first they said you have to get rid of the Statue of Liberty, uh, then they said if you don't make it smaller right, you can't have this Spider-Man movie in China. And Sony said, okay, we're not gonna have it in China. You know, so um, absolutely this is a huge concern. And I think the one thing that began to turn the tide was um, I think China's behavior during COVID was essential. So when it started to use the PPE, right, the personal protective equipment as a kind of, of a, you know, saying, if you don't thank us enough, or you know, if you don't do Huawei, you maybe are not going to have access to our PPE. Or if you criticize us, right, you're not going to have access to our PPE. I think China became unmasked a little bit, right, and that I think wasn't one important uh, inflection point. I think the other important inflection point was just the transparency and the attention that began to be paid. Um, and for this, I give a lot of credit to the Trump administration. Uh, to, to China's efforts, right, to use the leverage of its market to coerce actors and saying to American companies and others, you know, you should not do this, right? It's embarrassing that you will sacrifice, you know, values, American values, uh, for access to this market. And so I think there's a, a kind of a, a shaming 
um, element that has now taken hold, not only in the United States, but in other places as well. Um, so yes, I think the danger exists, it continues to exist, but I think we've at least turned one corner on it and are headed maybe in a better direction.